Oh, I'm going nervous. <laughs> uh, I hope I'm preaching what you want me to preach, Pastor Bill. That's what we're hoping for, aren't we? So we're going to look in uh, Matthew 28 and 19, 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. And of course, we'll stand to read the word of God. <clears throat> Okay, Matthew chapter 28, and uh, we find here in, uh, with Jesus speaking, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, Amen. Okay, let me have a word of prayer and we'll sit down. Father in heaven, we praise you for your grace. I pray, Lord, just use me today to speak to us, we ask, and be motivated for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, may be seated. And uh, I've titled, Be Motivated, Be a Witness. Because I think that's what your theme is, isn't it? Soul winning and trying to get out doing soul winning. And I think of it as a pastor sitting in my church as um, I want people to be motivated. And that's what we're supposed to be. So um, firstly, I think it's, uh, thank you for the privilege to speak to you, speak with your church. I appreciate that very much. And, um, and it's a great opportunity. Just to let you know what's happened in our church. We've had a, a blessing just recently that um, I think I shared it a bit at camp, I'm not sure. But... Um, uh, I was cutting wood at a neighbour's place and he asked me what, how I was going with the church and I said, well, I need to do the car park. And he pointed to this great big pile of uh, road base that he had there and he said, take what you want. So we organised it to f made the car park and uh, done a retainer wall and, uh, you know, like raised it up 400 mils on one side and so 13 truckloads of road base later and uh, we got this car park done. So it's... So now we've got a nice car park, you drive on there, it's hard surface, it's not going to wash away in the rain, if we get rain again. <laughs> but it's a, it's a blessing, it's a privilege, it makes it look like a car park, not, not look like, oh, where's the church? Oh, it's just near the grass there and the park in the paddock and this makes it more official, it's, it's actually a, a real blessing. So that's a real joy for us and uh, it's, it keeps us going. So, but... Uh, uh, that's just a little bit of an update, and uh, people are still coming to church. We had a few people sick today, which is not always good, is it? But um, um, we thank, thank God for the faithfulness of people we have. It's a blessing. And um, uh, <clears throat> it took about 12 months for one lady to get baptised, but she got baptised recently. And she's a big lady. She's not small. And uh, she was afraid. Hey? Huh? I still can't hear. Oh, she came here one night, I think, yeah. But anyhow, she's a lovely lady, and, uh, and uh, she was a bit worried about it for a long time, and then uh, the Lord touched her heart, moved her. She said, I need to get baptised. I need to serve the Lord. So that's, and now she's starting to come to church faithful, which is good. It's a blessing. So on this subject, be motivated, be a witness. We're looking at the subject of soul winning, or better should be described, witnessing, trying to get out to witness. And, uh, and I think sometimes as young people or as we start get, we get saved or we're starting to be involved with the church, it can be very daunting to the idea of going out to tell someone about the Lord. It can be daunting to think, I'm going to go out and letterbox, walk down the street and hand, put people things in letter. I'm going to touch someone's letterbox and... And when you first do it, it can be very scary, daunting, it's uh, unnerving. And uh, uh, the idea even to approach a complete stranger and start talking to them. Some people find that very difficult. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm just silly, but I'm just, I easy talk to people. If they're willing to talk, I'll talk. But uh, I got told as a kid I was always a chatterbox, so, and uh, <laughs> uh, that's just the way it is. You know, some kids, they won't talk to people, and other kids, they just straight up, they're bold, and they'll talk to anybody. That was me. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, 
But there can be an idea of uh, speaking to a stranger can be scary. It can be even foreign. Or even the idea of uh, coming on a church Saturday soul winning to go letterboxing or door knocking can may, maybe even seem way too difficult for me. Out of my league. I, I, maybe I'm not good enough or I'm not strong enough or I, I, I don't think I can do it. You, you feel like you're going to cave in because it's too fearful. But let me try and encourage you tonight that you can. It can be done. All people, it's not that hard. And, uh, and I want to encourage you. So my first point would be witnessing. We've got to understand what is witnessing. And uh, Jesus said here in uh, Matthew, he said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're to share the gospel. In fact, all the uh, gospels say it. In Luke chapter 24, it, and it says in verse 46, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, but beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. In uh, John chapter 20, verse 31, it says, John wrote, But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. He, in the book of Acts, we find when Jesus ascends up into heaven, but just before he says, but you shall receive power. And after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in, Judea, in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we get this idea that witnessing is in the Bible. We're told to be a witness. We're told to share the gospel. We're told to go out. And uh, we, we have this idea of witnesses. But uh, we've got to understand it a little bit more. The first thing we understand is you are a witness. You already are a witness. You might say, well, how can that be? How can I be a witness? Well, if you're saved and you know that Jesus Christ has saved you and given you eternal life, well, then you are a witness of what Christ has done to you. You've already witnessed Christ doing something to you. You could write it down. First, if we have, we've received the witness, haven't we? We've received it. We've received Christ. We have the testimony that Jesus saved us, and we could share that with someone. Uh, we could share something about it, or, or something where, when, or how we got saved. I'm sure if you're saved, you can remember something the day you got saved. You can remember something. I mean, I can't remember the actual date, but I've worked it out are reasonably close to the date and I can remember events about it I can remember what happened I can remember what I said I can't remember a lot of other things I said but I can remember what I said that day you can remember and it's funny it's something that stays fresh in you for the rest of your life because it was a, a something that happened in your life that's a major event and that's why Romans says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved once you call on Christ you, us, you receive Christ you become saved you have a witness. God saved you. The Lord done a work. He saved you. You, you have a testimony of that. And uh, we have that witness of the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me explain something about witnessing. Say, for example, you're standing on the street and uh, you see uh, a homeless man sitting on the street in the corner and then you saw Mr. Scott Morrison walking down the road and give that homeless man a $20 note. You would have been a witness for that. What about if it's the other way around? Let's make it more personal. What about if uh, something happened in your life or, and some and circumstance prevailed against you and you become that homeless person? It could happen. Nothing's impossible. Lazarus was homeless, wasn't he? And uh, you're that homeless person sitting on the street and you're hungry and a bit cold and Mr. Morrison just happened to pull up in front of your house with his, with his car and in front of where you're sitting and he hops out the car and gives you a $100 note. Do you know, you would be a witness of that, wouldn't you? Even though it happened to you, you are actually a primary, first class, on hand witness of somebody giving you $100. That would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? Eh? You'd, you'd, you'd go and get something to eat, that's for sure. And uh, Well, this is the same as the day that you received the Lord Jesus Christ. It happened to you. You are a witness of Jesus saving you. You remember that day you prayed and said, Lord, save me. And you remember that. It's, it, you, it's a testimony in your life. And if somebody said, what happened to you that day? You could probably share something about that day. 
oh, I really bombed out. And then all of a sudden I met this guy and he just showed me about the gospel and I said, yes, I want to get saved. And you trusted Christ. It happened to you. And uh, Christ come into your life. And so you are a witness to that. You witness that in your life. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 10, the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. And uh, this is the record that God had given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Once you've received Christ, you've received the witness that he saved you. That's a good thing, isn't it? It's a great thing. And uh, you could testify. You knew you was lost and going to hell and you heard the gospel and Christ saved you. He paid the penalty in full to your soul. And, uh, <clears throat> and when, he asked, when you was asked, would you, save, would you ask the Lord to save you? What did you reply? Yes. Yes. I didn't even say yes. I said, I suppose I better. <laughs> what choice do you have <laughs> when the when the sirens go behind you and you're driving the car you think i better pull over <laughs> you don't try to keep driving do you and uh, when you get apprehended you, you pull over and so you prayed and asked christ to save you and you realize jesus saved you somewhere along the line it kicks in it's like something happened my life changed and no longer can i feel comfortable doing what i used to do and now i have to change my ways and and then all of a sudden you start coming to church and start growing. You start finding it's pleasant to read the Bible and you start growing. So you, you, you become a witness to that. And so when we become a witness, what do we do after that is we share that witness. We share it. We tell others about it. And uh, that's the second part about being a witness is that we share that witness with other people. We share it around. And uh, like Pastor Bill said there, it's usually people who you know are the ones you have the best testimony with. You know, it's usually the cold canvas going, door knocking. and You know, you meet people, but I found in a general, you never see them again. I found even you, you see this person, you say, well, they're interested, and they even give an open invitation to come back. And, and you, so you go back to their place, and they're not home. And you go, okay, I'll come back at this time. So you go back again and, oh, no, she's sick today. I can't make it today. Or they're not home again. And I found you try about five times, you missed it. They can't get them again. Even though you know where they live, you, know, you probably even get their phone number. You ring them up, they don't answer the phone. But you've got that one little window that one day you've got a chance. And uh, so you've got to take that opportunity but uh when you come to people you know sometimes you can sit down and share the testimony like those people in the basketball club and and you know they'll come back and they will think about it for a while and then they'll meet you again somebody says some statistic takes 40 visits before someone gets saved 40 40 no, <laughs> 40, five times was it five times four or something <laughs> <laughs> Maths is not my forte. <clears throat> we share the witness. And, uh, and there's a goal or a purpose we have in witnessing. And that goal is to win that person that we're speaking to to receive the same thing that we've got. To receive the same. And uh, <clears throat> I know that when we come to that place of, oh, I've got to share my testimony, you know what happens? The butterflies kick in real quick. Uh, you feel nervous. I find when it comes to door knocking time, we have door knocking as well, I'll feel sick. I'll feel lethargy. I don't want to be motivated. I find I just can't seem to hold things together. I've just got to really purpose myself, go regardless of your feelings. Your feelings will get in the way. You've just got to go. And it doesn't go away. I know when, before when I was, uh, I know one stage there, uh, you know, you drive the car to the place where you're going to go door knocking on the street and you can't get out the car. You're stuck in the car. I heard one preacher say he got to this position where he'd pull up and then he'd turn the car off, wind the window down and throw the keys on the footpath and wind the window up again. And after all, he get hot in the car and he says, I've got to get out to get the keys. And once he gets out, he says, well, we might as well keep going now. It's just that sometimes you get a point in life that you just can't seem to, it doesn't seem to happen. You know, I get it every day. Every day I get that when I wake up, I go, 
What shirt shall I wear? <laughs> we all have it. Everybody's got it somewhere. And, uh, but you get the butterflies and you say, I don't know what to do. And uh, <clears throat> they can't seem to get motivated. You know, you might not realise it, but I'm really actually, you know, the saying today is everyone's got to have a can-do attitude. We've heard that, haven't we? You see job interviews, you've got to have a can-do attitude. Well, guess what? I've got a no-can-do attitude. I'm born with it. <laughs> I can't do it. I don't have the ability. I, I don't know how to do it. I, I seem to like, you, you run into that, oh, I don't know if I can do it. Just like, you, you feel that way in the sense of, oh, I, I'm not worthy of it. And it's just something, you, everyone has their own little thing, don't they? And that's my little thing. I'm a no-can-do. You know, some people are really shy. I'm not really shy, but I'm, I, I'm like a, oh, I don't know if I can do it. I'll try and do a project. I've got half a million, half projects at home, half started and not finished. Because you get to that point, you, know, oh, you want to do it, you go and do it, and then you find, oh, I can't do it. I have a no can do. But, you know, we need to have a can do. But, but when you've got something there, you need something to motivate you to get to do it. You need a motivation. And that's what I want to try and help you with. Have a motivation to be a witness. And we need it. We need to be motivated to be witnesses. Something's going to motivate you. And that's what I want to try and help you with. What drives a man to go to work? I mean, really, some of, that, some of us, you see people, they work horrible jobs. Some people work really horrible jobs and they get up and go to work every day. I mean, I worked 10 years flipping eggs, smashing eggs. That's what I did it for 10 years, breaking eggs all day, every day, breaking eggs. And they say, I work in an egg factory. Did you break any? Yeah, we broke the lot. <laughs> that was our job, to break them and smash them up and get the egg and the shell separated and make liquid whole egg. But, you know, you did it for years and years, working in this horrible, smelly old factory and wrecking your back and you're slaving away and you think, what motivates someone to keep doing that? What drives a lady at the home to keep making her home beautiful and nice and homely and comfortable and clean and, and you know, like decorated and, and preparing the food. What motivates you to do that? There's something that's going to motivate us. And uh, <clears throat> something always motivates us what, what we do. I mean, uh, you know, what really would stop you? Say you've got a horrible job, for example. What stops you just waking up in the morning and just saying, I'm not going to go to work today. I'm just going to sit home and watch the goggle box and watch days of my life all day and not go to work. But you know what's going to happen. Your boss will ring up and say you don't have a job anymore. I found that out as a young person. I said, the, par <laughs> the party sound better than going to work. So I got my friend to ring up the boss and say I was sick. And so I'm like, okay, ready, ready the party, yeah, I'm going to go. And it's at the door. I open the door and there's my boss. How are you feeling? Uh, oh. <laughs> Here's your final pay. <laughs> You're finished, you see? If you want to do what you want to do, so something motivates you. You know, money motivates you, doesn't it? You realise you go, because oh, you're going to get paid. Get that money. Or it might be a self-image that motivates you. The lady that cleans a house or even the, someone doing a particular job. It's their self-image. Uh, it could be the acceptance of another person. I find that I could do this because that's acceptable with what my family thinks I should do, not really what I want to do. You know, you might say, I want to be, I want to be, uh, let's, let's try and think of something. I want to be a gardener. I want to do a gardening job. I want to work as a gardener. That's really my passion. But my family says, son, that's just a low-grade job. We want, you to be, uh, we want you to be a doctor. And you've got the capabilities to be a doctor. Is that right? And so you, you accept it. I do this because I'm, I'm a doctor. And you find you're a doctor. But really, you'd rather just be a gardener because that's your passion. But what, was, what motivates you? There's lots of things motivate people today. But we need a motivation to be one to be a witness for Christ. You need to be motivated to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, we need to be motivated to win someone to Christ. I want to try and motivate you that everybody here says, I'm going to try and make an effort to be door knocking or soul winning or tracking. Be a part of the soul winning team. Be a part of the, the church program to get out there, go letterboxing. 
You can all do it. You all got a, you all got legs, and you all got a hand. You can do it. All got a top pocket. Guys always will buy a shirt with top pockets. You know why? So you can put tracks in there. <laughs> it must be the devil's plan to have no top pockets in a shirt. So you can't put a track in there. But uh, uh, you need a motivation to try and get out there and be a part of the program. And I found the Bible has some very great motivations, motivators for us to want to be a part of the church soul winning uh, program. And uh, the first one is hell. Hell is a real place. I preached on hell this morning. Hell is a real place. Luke 16 verse 22 says, And it come to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. You know, we find here Jesus told this story and he said it was a certain man. It wasn't a parable. It was a real man. Lazarus was a real man and the rich man was a real man. It wasn't a parable. And he said a certain man who was fair and sumptuous and it was a certain beggar named Lazarus. And Jesus probably said, and he's a friend of mine. <laughs> but he said, they both died, but Lazarus was ended up in Abraham's bosom. But the rich man, it says, in hell he lift up his eyes. And he starts crying out and pleading to Abraham. You know, Jesus believed in hell. He knew it was a literal place, a literal lake of fire. It's a place where people literally really do go when they die. My father is in hell. My, have, we know people that are in hell. They died without Christ. They'll go to hell. They'll be there forever. They'll be in a burning fire forever until hell and death go cast into the lake of fire. Someone who's not saved and they die like that rich man will literally go there to a place called hell. Place forever, burning. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. If you died today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? Get the whole witness, get the whole testimony. But in your heart, you realize, you know, I've worked it out. If I died now, I'm going to go to hell. Would you like to get saved? Well, I better because I don't want to go to hell. That's a pretty good motivator, isn't it? It's a pretty good motivator if we want to tell people about Christ. We might say, you know, uh, Hell's real. I didn't want to go to hell, and I certainly don't want my friend to go to hell. Maybe I better tell them to, about Jesus. I don't want them to go to hell because I didn't tell them. And, uh, you know, God might just want to use you to reach that person on that street, down that road, to hear the gospel. I came here to this church. I'll tell you what happened. I came here, and the pastor said, we're going door knocking. And so I come home, help door knocking, and I met a Burmese man. Is that right? I met a Burmese man, and he said he's a Christian, so I started talking to him. And he invited me to start, he's got a home group, you probably all know him. And he's got a home group, so he asked me to start speaking there. So I started speaking there. And I think we led about four or five of the boys to Christ. Some of them are still saved. They all got saved. That's a blessing, isn't it? So God said, I want you to be there at this time, because there's that person, and that person knows this person, that person, and there's a person that's going to get saved. You just don't know. God's going to use you. And you don't want them to go to hell. Another motivator is heaven. Heaven's a motivator. John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. You know, the fact that we have this opportunity to go to heaven should motivate us and be a great motivation for us to want others to come to this same great heaven. In fact, heaven is so good, Paul, when he saw it, he said, I've seen it, but I can't even tell you because it's too good. He wasn't allowed to share it because it's too good. It was a great place. He said, heaven was a great place. And, uh, and we should be motivated to want to see others come to this same glorious place that we're going to heaven's a door open for all men god wants to use us to help bring others to this same heaven that's god given god has given us and uh it's a great opportunity you know you think about it if if you had this chance to do it would you like to do it if i said uh, you're not going to take any for yourself because you've got your two ounces of gold i'm going to give you a bag of two ounces of gold pieces 
and you're going to go down in Queen Street Mall, they'll probably kick you out for not having a permit, for, but I want you to give away these two-ounce pieces of gold to people. I think that'd be fun. I reckon that'd be fun, trying to give away pieces of gold to someone. You could say, let's make a use example, $50 notes. You want to, I'll go a big stack of $50 notes, and I want you to give it away. Give one person $50, every person you meet, you've got to give them $50. Would that be fun? I reckon that'd be fun. I reckon it'd be great just to see people go, really? I mean, that'd be great fun. But you know, we've got something more precious than gold or silver or money. All that's going to perish. We've got heaven. And if we've got heaven, we can give it out and give it out and give it out. We never lose anything. In fact, it builds. If we don't lose, we gain. And just think, we can try and help someone to have that same gold street that we're going to go on. We have that chance. And uh, when they get saved, they'll go to heaven. And that's more valuable than gold on this earth. Another motivator we should have is love. Love is a motivator. Romans 5.8 said, but, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Love's a great motivator. In fact, love is one of your best motivators. And uh, uh, the fact that I think about it, that God loved me and gave his life for me, it's a great motivator for me to try and win others to Christ. Great motivator is love, because love, love won't look at the downside. Love won't look at the bad side. Love will look at the upside all the time. Love will look at the right side. God commended his love to save me and uh, I can command, uh, commend my love to others to help them get to saved. You know, I, I have some love and I say, you know, I'm motivated. I don't do it because I have to. I do it because I love people. I want people to get saved. I want them to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you do it because you love them enough that you want them to go to heaven. You want, you want them to trust on the Lord Jesus Christ. You love them. And uh, we think about the love of God and the love that comes from God. That should be the real strong motivator to make you want to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. How much does God love you? God so loved the world that he just passed down a few pennies. No, God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. He gave the Lord Jesus Christ to willingly suffer on the cross and bear the punishment of sin on the cross and pay for our sins with his own blood, not because he had to, because he loved us. And God loved you. He, in fact, God prepared that before he even started the world. He said, I'm going to create a world, but this world will need a saviour. So I'm going to prepare the saviour first and then I'll make the world. And then he made the world and he made it perfect and then he said, Adam's going to fall over and he did. And then here we are, thousands of years later, God said, I've already done it for you. Already made it possible because I love my creation. And uh, God's love in us will overcome fear. We have a fear of man. That's what stops us, doesn't it? We fear what man can do. We fear, what, what's going to happen if I don't know what to say? Don't worry about it. Just give him a drag. You know, I've found a lot of times when I use a track, I just use what's on the back of the track. In fact, i found a good method, Pastor Bill, is you have two tracks and you give one in, you get one in the door. When you're door, letter boxing or uh, door knocking, get the track in the door. And then you try and start a conversation and when you get around the conversation, you say, have a look at that track I just gave you. And they look at it and look at the back. It's got the plan of salvation there. And you hold your track up and they got their track and you can read it through and witness to them. That's pretty hard, isn't it? That's why it's there. So you have two, one in your hand and you give one out. And then you can talk with what's in your hand. <clears throat> it's a great thing. And uh, the, the fear is there, but don't worry about the fear. Learn to love. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. See, your perfect love in Christ will overcome any fear. Fear that you may have of people or the fear of the unknown. And if we love the Lord, if we think about it, if we love the Lord, we love our church, we love the people in our church, I hope you love one another, that's what we're supposed to do, aren't we? When we love one another, look at your brother next door, your sister next door, you say, you know, I love that person. When I come to church, I'm come because I want to give to that person. 
Pastor Bill comes because he wants to give to you. He loves you. He has a great love for you. You love one another. That's why you come. You've got to learn to love one another. And if you say, I love my brother and my sister, I'm going to encourage them, I'll go out witnessing. I want to encourage my brother and sister. And uh, we love the brethren in the church. We'll find we'll get motivated to be on church visitation just for a start. We say, I love my church. I love my Lord. I love my brothers and sisters. I'm going to try and be out church so many. Think about it this way. The church stays alive by what we do. Think about it. If the church fails to get out there and be motivated to love one another and to love the world, well, it'll only take a generation and you'll be sitting alone as some churches are around in the world as just a bunch of old people because all the young people aren't coming to church anymore. Because no one went out to reach them. No one went out to do the work to try and reach someone. If we, didn't, if we don't go out and reach someone, guess what? This is going to be your last generation. <laughs> you know in Ephesians it talks about taking the candlestick out. It says you've left your first love. You know what the first love is? Your love to win others to Christ. Your love for Jesus to do what Jesus wants you love. And uh, <clears throat> you, you want this church to grow. The only way it's going to grow is it's not Pastor Bill. It's everyone hold up your hand. Hold up your hand. I want everyone to be awake here. Everyone hold up your hand. Great. We've got everyone to be volunteers. Great. <laughs> That's who's going to do it. It's not going to be next door. It's going to be me. I love outwardly. And for that, hey, what? I love someone. I can hand a bunch of tracks out. Go letterboxing. That's really, letterboxing is really easy. In fact, it's... Some of us olders, we need to do it to exercise, you know. <laughs> the walking exercise. Yes. Here's another motivation. Obedience. Obedience. We all are obedient, aren't we? <clears throat> We're obedient. Luke chapter 19, verse 13, he says, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. And he said unto them, Occupy till I come. What we need to realise is Jesus uh, didn't give us a choice about witnessing for him. It's not a choice. It's not a, I can choose this. He said, go. It's a command. He commands us to go. He commands believers to be a witness for him. Just like he gave those servants the 10 pounds and he commanded them, he said, occupy till I come. Meaning to say, he said, you're going to use that 10 pounds and you're going to gain more money with that. You've got to use it to make money. You've got to build on that. You can't just bury it in a napkin under the... No, you've got to get that 10 pounds and I want you to make that increase. I've got, you've got to work with that 10 pounds. Just like somebody would give you uh, $10,000, you've got to try and work that to make some more money. If That's what God's given it to you for. You've got to use it. You know, that's what he wants us to do. And so he says, he's given us a talent. He's given us the ability to win someone to the Lord. He's given us a talent. He's given us the church to bring people to church. He's given us a talent that we can help people get trained up to go out and do more. And so he tells us to occupy and to occupy till he comes. And just like the brother said, we're waiting for him to come. I'm waiting for the Lord to come. And he hasn't come yet, so let's keep working. We've got to obey him, to be obedient to him. And uh, as his children, we should be obedient. And with obedience, we come to the last point, is rewards. You know, if you go soul winning, there's going to be rewards. That's going to be a motivator. You go to work because you love your job, right? <laughs> you go to work because you love the people at work, don't you, right? <clears throat> When one of the, I just heard today one of the guys said they had uh, the rainbow crowd having a meeting at work. And they keep your personal life to personal, man. It's like, if that's what you want, you keep it personal. We're in the ark. You guys can have the rainbow. We're in the ark. <laughs> and we're, we're just having a bit of a joke, you know. Maybe as Christians we should wear flames. They, they survived the flood, but guess what? The next one's not going to be a flood. It's going to be a fire. They won't be holding a rainbow up then, will they? <laughs> Uh, but that's another, another kettle, but we're going to have rewards. In Matthew chapter 25, it says in verse 20, he says in that same passage about the talents, about five talents and the six talents, he says to the man with the talents, he said, uh, 
He received five talents, come and, and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And the Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter in, enter in the joy of the Lord. I don't believe God is slack in rewarding us. I believe God will bless us. He'll bless us here, but he'll bless us in heaven as well. And, uh, <clears throat> he's given us a job to do. We do the job and he will reward us. I mean, we like rewards, don't we? We all like rewards, don't we? I do. We like birthday presents. And uh, when, I, when, uh, when I think about it, when I got saved, I pretty much had nothing. I had a rucksack and a small little car. That was it. I didn't have any people to be responsible to. I had very little worldly possessions. I had no savings or wealth in my hand. I had really much nothing when I got saved. In fact, I was ready to jump off a cliff. That's where I was when I got saved. And then when I understood how God works and how he blesses, I realized in this world I may never be rich. But when I get to heaven, I want to be rich. I want to have rewards when I get to heaven. You know, you work a job. And you know, if, you, if I said to you, I am going to want you to do this job, I'm not going to pay you for 12 months, but at the end of the 12 months, I'm going to give you half a million dollars. Would you do that work for, for 12 months without pay? And half the, you'd be surprised a lot of people wouldn't. A lot of people get halfway through and they'll bomb out. They'll say, I can't do it because I'm running out of money. I can't survive. They wouldn't work it out. You could just borrow, beg and steal whatever you can to get through that 12-month period to get to the, to the end of the goal. But that's what our life is as Christians. We serve the Lord. We, we obey him. We try and win souls to Christ. And when we get to glory, he's going to reward us. Like we've never imagined what it's going to be like. We're going to be gloriously Rich forever. I like that idea. You can have the world's gold, but I want to be rich in heaven. Because guess what? The moth's going to eat your wealth here. The rust's going to corrupt. Your car's going to rust out, isn't it? You can, you can have your nice uh, uh, Maserati or whatever you want, but guess what? The rust will come in eventually. The moth will come, or if not, someone will steal it. The thieves will come and take it away. It will all happen. But when you get to heaven, there's going to be no rust, no moths, and no thieves there. And your wealth is secure. And every bit of wealth you gain here, it goes to heaven, it's secure. It's not going to go away. It's going to keep building. It's going to keep gaining. And uh, I don't know, it's temporal on this world, eternity is forever. Won't that be good? Won't you like to uh, be in a better position in heaven? You know how you get there? It's by being obedient here. Be motivated to be soul winners here, to try and win someone to Christ. And uh, he will reward us. He will give us great treasure. When we get to heaven, we'll be able to spend it all. So just as a conclusion there, would you be motivated to be a witness? Can I motivate you to be a witness? Hell's there. Heaven is there. We need to have love. There's obedience and then there's reward. The question is, we just got to be willing to do it. Are you going to be motivated? And my goal is from this message is that Pastor Bill, when he comes to Saturday Soul Winning, you're all going to be here. If you can't get out, there's probably something you could do to help others to get out. You know, I always look at it and say, you might not be able to get out, but you might be say, you know, I've got these two little kids here. Maybe I could look after the kids while you go out. I could do something like that. Maybe I could relieve you of something so you could go out. You know, maybe whoever's doing the church cleaning is say, look, I'll tell you what, I'll trade places. I can't get out in the street, but I'll do your church cleaning and you can go out in the street. There's always something you can do, isn't there? There's always somewhere you can help out. And uh, maybe you can sit here, stamp the tracks. You can't get out. There's always something. You've just got to be motivated to see... Lord, I want to be involved in church soul winning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord Jesus, you bless. And I pray, dear God, you help us to be motivated to want to win others to Christ. We ask you to move in our hearts in Jesus' name.